Last but not least. All right. Last but not least, I hope you all were able to work on some other stuff. Thank you for your patience. Calling Red Rock Financial Services versus Nona Tobin, A828840 C. Um, this is Nona Tobin's motion for summary judgment versus counter defendant Red Rock Financial Services and cross defendant Nation Star Mortgage and Wells Fargo and motion for punitive damages and sanctions. And it is defendant Nona Tobin's amended motion for an order to distribute interpleaded proceeds and Red Rock Financial Services motion to dismiss counterclaim and petition for sanctions as well as a joinder. To the extent that, let's do the motion to dismiss first. So your honor, um, I apologize for interrupting the order. Um, Ms. Tobin did file her motion to distribute before the other two motions were filed. And so I just want to note for the record that um, we we would argue that she should be able to hear, you should be able to hear those, uh, that, that motion first. The docket says 412-21, motion for distribution, and then 415, Ms. Tobin filed a motion for summary judgment. And then on 416, the motion to dismiss was filed. That's I, that's the order on the docket. I understand, Mr. Thompson, but to the extent that there have been two other lawsuits filed in this case, and um, we have issues of claim preclusion in this case, um, I think that the court's potential decision on some of this may moot out some of the rest of this. But um, let me just ask, Mr. Scow, Mr. Lockman, um, would you agree that we still have the issue of the interplay proceeds no matter what? But, Your Honor, this is Stephen Scow, and uh, th this case was started as an interpleader. Right. And so at the end of the day, we will be left with that question. But I, I think Your Honor's decision to take things out of order does make sense because Ms. Tobin's motion seeking to have the distribution of those proceeds, that was filed first, but she's also filed claims wherein she is again attacking the validity of the underlying sale that was done back in 2014. Right. And so th those requests don't don't work together. So if if we're going to ask for funds to be issued, but then still seek to invalidate the sale, I mean, those those two arguments just simply don't work. Right. It, it, the court would almost have to wait on the request to distribute the proceeds until after there was a determination on whether or not the validity of the sale was properly heard a few times before. Right, because if the sale, if the sale doesn't happen and the sale is somehow unwound, then there are no proceeds, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Under the statute NRS 116, the effect of the sale is terminated, and, and so there are no excess proceeds. Exactly right. Okay, so that's, that's the reason why, Mr. Thompson, that we are going to hear the motion to dismiss first, um, because I think that that makes some sense. So the court is using its discretion to take these out of order. Mr. Scow, are you gonna? Who's gonna be arguing the motion to dismiss? Uh, Your Honor, we, my office filed that. I'm, I'm planning to argue. I know Mr. Lackman, they, they filed a joinder, so they right. may have separate comments. Okay, that's fine. You may proceed. All right. It, well, thank you, Your Honor, and, and I hope you don't mind. But at the outset, I, I would just like to ask if Your Honor has any questions. I, I noted earlier that you had four pages of notes, and I don't want to rehash things that are already clear in your mind, but um, therefore I wanted to see if you had questions for me first. Um, no, I really don't. Um, I mean, to me, 
it seems it seems like we have a straight up claim preclusion issue here um, and so well let me just let me just say this um, the court's original um, do you all just want me to tell you what my inclination was and then well, that, that's fine your honor I'm, I just don't want to ask you to waste time and hear me out if you've already read everything which I understand you have so I think it's helpful for the parties we can hear what your inclination is that's helpful Mr. Thompson, do you want to hear my inclinations or do you all want to make argument? Your Honor, I'm prepared to make arguments. Um, again, this is a kind of an unusual situation where all the briefing was done um, by a pro, pro per uh, uh, defendant in this case and counterclaimant. And, and yet, um, there are some major problems with um, some of the arguments we disagree first of all that um, that you you can't say on the one hand distribute the funds if you're still disputing a sale um, so so we disagree with that proposition and the main reason is is that the statute says you're supposed to distribute the, the funds after the sale six years the whole reason that you have um, the interpleader statutes is because the funds are distributed so to make an argument that the funds um, couldn't be distributed because there there were claims and disputed claims to the to the title and, and the funds, that's the whole purpose that you you have an interpleader action. I don't think we would have all these issues of supposed claim preclusion if the funds had been distributed um, as was the duty six years ago. So um, we, you know, these these issues were raised. Um, and we believe this complaint is even frivolous, the money should have just gone right to our client because uh, there's no other recorded interest or person under the statute that would take these excess proceeds. We have release of liens from all the people that were named in the complaint as defendants, as interested parties, except for Ms. Tobin. And we have record of request after request, including other lawsuits that were, in our mind, we've appealed them because it's wrongfully dismissed when we asked that the proceeds be distributed in a prior lawsuit and yet the judge dismissed that case even though that was a new issue with a current pending um, matter that had not been resolved so again um, <laughs> we have there's a lot of problems we we believe with these prior rulings and it's not simple enough to just say claim preclusion issue preclusion um, you know, there's allegations of fraud on the court, and even just the issue of the excess proceeds uh, taking six years is uh, is evidence enough of a red flag that um, that your honor could, if 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 she so chose to do so, give Miss Tobin her day in court to finally have evidence prevent presented as to what really happened with with this foreclosure sale. So that, that's my, sorry, it's not a short yes or no answer, but that's my answer to your honor's question. All right. Seeing Mr. Uh, Mr. Scow that Mr. Thompson wants to argue, we're gonna go ahead and create a record. So make your argument, Mr. Scow. Okay, thank you, your honor. As, as the court is aware from from the briefs and the various dockets and prior matters. Uh, there was a, a foreclosure sale that occurred. Uh, this was an HOA foreclosure sale that occurred way back in August of 2014. It was August 15, 2014. And thereafter, um, much like many of the hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of cases that have been filed in this district, there was a dispute between the purchaser of the property and the lender and the impact of this HOA foreclosure sale. Whether, and the question being whether or not the association's foreclosure sale wiped out the bank's first position lien. And so that while that case was ongoing, uh, Ms. Tobin, who is a party now in this case, she filed a, a and interplayed into that prior matter 
in January of 2017. And, and Your Honor, when, when this initial case was first lodged, uh, there, there is a very significant question about where the excess proceeds go. Um, the excess proceeds have to go in order of um, priority. And so the issue between the bank and the, and the purchaser at the August 2014 foreclosure sale really precludes any, any distribution uh, because there's complete uncertainty and there's uncertainty whether or not the sale would even be upheld. And when Ms. Tobin joined that suit in 2017, uh, she vigorously attacked the merits of the sale uh, and and was urging the court to to set that sale aside. There was a motion that was filed for summary judgment by the association, and on April seventeenth, uh, I believe that was of twenty nineteen, the the court found in favor of the association, finding that that the foreclosure sale was done properly, and. And after that finding, there was a full trial on the merits, and it ends up that all other claims were dismissed. And those claims were dismissed in June of 2019, where after um, Ms. Tobin, unhappy with that decision, she filed an appeal. <clears throat> and I, I wanted to note, Your Honor, that this first action where she was involved, Ms. Tobin filed it in her capacity as, as the trustee of, of the trust. There was a trust that was the owner of this property initially, and, and Ms. Tobin was, was not the owner, so she was bringing this in her capacity as, as a trustee. So after, after the full trial, after the, after the dismissal of claims, uh, there was an appeal. Uh, I believe that appeal has been resolved with an affirmation of the lower court's decision. Um, Ms. Tobin then, just a few weeks after the, the first case was dismissed after the judge made the decision that she did. Ms. Tobin, in her individual capacity, filed a brand new case. And, and she made the exact same claims um, against the exact same parties. And that case was dismissed on December 3rd, 2020, based on claim preclusion. And it's important to note that in the first case, Red Rock was not a party to the action and the dispute between um, the bank and the purchaser. Ms. Tobin did file a motion seeking to bring a third party complaint against Red Rock, and I believe Your Honor is even against me personally, and she never did serve that, those claims. But nonetheless, here we are in, in case two, and Again, this was a few weeks after the first case was dismissed. Same claims. Um, we filed a motion to dismiss based on claim preclusion. And on December 3rd, 2020, the, the court, after hearing arguments, found that non-mutual claim preclusion applied. And the court applied that, that doctrine because we have the same the same party bringing claims. Ms. Tobin was in privity with herself in her alleged position as as trustee of the trust. There was a, a final judgment in the first action, and the second case is based on the same facts, it's the same claims. And so after the court dismissed all those claims, this is case two, on December 3rd, 2020, Ms. Tobin again appealed, and that, that appeal is now pending. Well, after, after the second attempt to invalidate the sale was, was shut down, then Red Rock, we, we decided that was the time then to in, interplead the funds so the court could make a decision on, on who is entitled to the funds per the statute. And prior to that, there was a dispute, an ongoing dispute that Ms. Tobin is the one that uh, was, was prosecuting regarding the validity of the sale. Well, as Your Honor is familiar, that interpleader, interpleader case is the one before you now. And, and Ms. Tobin is again bringing the exact types of claims against the same parties. And she is again attacking the 2014 sale. And at the same time, I understand she has, has filed and demand for these proceeds, but there is 
is now the question of whether or not the sale is going to be unwound again, which, Your Honor, we completely disagree with that. And we believe all of her claims, except for her claim, you know, she, she may have a claim to those proceeds, but that's for the court to decide. But we're asking that, that all of her counterclaims be dismissed. And they should be dismissed clearly on, on claim preclusion. And, and I hate to say it's claim preclusion on steroids, but it is because her claims have already been dismissed twice. We've got a final judgment. We've got the same parties. We've got the same claims. And um, her counsel may try to argue that, hey, there's a lot of other complexities and issues. Well, those complexities were issues that happened in the prior two cases. We've already got two matters, and Ms. Tobin has already filed numerous complaints against attorneys. She's filed complaints against the judges. She's filed complaints against everybody. Those rulings have been finalized. The first matter has been concluded by appeal. The second one is pending appeal. But uh, obviously, she is, she's not happy with those rulings, and so she continues to litigate and wants to litigate these same claims again. And Your Honor, even if claim preclusion didn't apply, each one of her claims should be dismissed because of the statute of limitations. If the sale happened in August of 2014, the longest statute of limitation we have in the state is six years. And she brought her claims seven years later. So each claim that she's brought, which she has brought before, should be dismissed on statute of limitations grounds. And if that wasn't enough, Your Honor, we can look at the, the details of, of each of her claims. And she's failed to plead, uh, properly plead each and every one of those claims. So we've got pre claim preclusion times two. We've got statute of limitations, which is an absolute bar to each of her claims. And we've got a failure to properly plead. And, Your Honor, these claims should be, should be stricken as time barred. And I, I do note again that the remaining issue should be whether or not Ms. Tobin is entitled to the excess proceeds. And that's, that's something that Red Rock isn't even in a position to opine on. That's something for the court to decide. I understand that the other parties even reached out and offered to agree that she would be entitled to the remaining funds, but she's intent on, on litigating further. So, Your Honor, that's, that's the gist of it. I know you're already familiar with it, and so I'll, I'll ask again if you have any questions or anything that you'd like me to clarify. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I have one question for you, Mr. Scow. As far as the appeal that's pending, has that been fully briefed in the Supreme Court? No, Your Honor. The, the second case, um, there have been numerous extensions requested, and I believe the opening briefs are going to be due next month. Um, I don't recall the exact date, though, but they, that case has not been fully briefed. It's, it's limping along. Okay, so I guess my question is, is if the claims in the second case are exactly the same claims and those are up on appeal, I mean, Mr. Thompson, I see you shaking your head and the court will note so that you can stop shaking your head that there is an additional claim of racketeering in this case, but other than that, um, the claims are the same. There's one additional cause of action from what I could see. Um, but I guess my question is, is that if, if the, the claims or the majority of claims, I will say, are the same in this case as the ones that are in the second case, then don't we have an issue with the fact that, I mean, isn't this equivalent to forum shopping at this point? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's somewhat similar to forum shopping. I guess in my mind, when I think of forum shopping, I, I think of filing in a different jurisdiction. This is in the exact same jurisdiction. So, no, but to the but extent it, you're that you're trying to get a different decision from a different judge, I'm looking at it from that perspective. Yes. Yes, I, and Your Honor, I, I agree with that, and that's that's the whole reason that we have claim preclusion, right. so that we don't have to deal with the same claims over and over. Right. All right. Let me yes. hear. Let me hear from you, Mr. Thompson. 
And Your Honor, um, the reason I was just shaking my head, I mean, it's, it's, it's not true <laughs> that the statement made by counsel respectfully is the exact same claims with the exact same parties. That's not true. The record, record will show that. I'll need to prove to the court that they're not the exact same claims and they're not the exact same parties. Um, the parties admit that there was a claim in the second case for unjust enrichment to distribute the funds. So just on that admission, they're not exactly the same. Well, the second, Mr. Thompson, the second, let me just say this because I've outlined, I have all of the four complaints sitting right here that I've looked at. Let me just say that, and so so that you can be assured that I've looked at this. The causes of action in the first case were quiet title and equitable relief, fraudulent reconveyance, unjust enrichment, civil conspiracy, and preliminary and permanent injunction. The causes of action in the second case were quiet title, unjust enrichment, and declaratory relief. In this third case, we have interpleader, unjust enrichment, fraud, and racketeering. So to the extent that unjust enrichment was the same in all three cases, that has been brought. To the extent that you have, and I already mentioned, you have a racketeering claim um, and you have a fraud claim. So I guess there's two other causes of action that are fraud and racketeering that weren't previously brought. Um, but the equitable relief, to the extent that quiet title and equitable relief in the first case, equitable relief could in fact be the interpleader. And I don't think that there's any um, statement by either Mr. Lockman or Mr. Scow um, as to the interpleader will stay even if the other causes of action that she has brought would go away. So that's, I'll just say that going forward and now you may go ahead, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, thank you, Your no Honor. Um, it, just, it just proved my point that they're not exactly the same. That's my only point. And Your Honor just made it. There's different claims. Unjust enrichment is a cause of action, but the claim within that was never for um, the proceeds to be distributed until the second second uh, action. In addition, um, Nona Tobin tried to intervene as an individual and assert her individual rights in, in the first case, and she was not even allowed to um, participate in the trial. So it's really kind of a sham to say that there was a full trial on the merits. People keep saying that and writing that, that she did not participate in should be not even a footnote, it should be in all bold and all caps. To preserve her rights as an individual, not knowing what was going to happen with the first appeal, she filed the second case, not to harass the parties, not to annoy the courts, not to be a vexatious litigant. She did that because it's very clear from the record in the first case that even though she was allowed to intervene, she participated for months as an individual separate from her capacity as a trustee of the trust that owned the property. She was at the last minute excluded due to an ex parte hearing that happened. She was not invited to that hearing. She was told it would not happen. And the parties went ahead with it with the judge and she was excluded and kicked out of the case as an individual. So in order logically to make sure that her rights were not expired and that she met the statute of limitations, the second lawsuit was filed by her as an individual to litigate her claims. That is the, that issue about whether or not she's an individual and whether she was kicked out in the first case, those are appealable issues that are up on appeal and they have not been breached. There's no forum shopping, Your Honor. We've made demand for this money and these claims are compulsory for counterclaims and are compulsory in this action. If we're going to talk about the funds and why they were not distributed, even though there were release of liens, the last release 
was in 2017. So maybe we don't go back to 2014, but the last disputed lien besides Nona Tobin was in 2017. It's a matter of public record. Those are recorded uh, releases with the Clark County Recorder's Office. I can give you the dates of when those happened. Um, the the, the uh, Wells Fargo uh, released their lien on 3-12-15. Nation Star released their lien and any claims for the money on 6-3-19. And Republic Services released their lien 3-30-17. So that is why um, Ms. Tobin has brought these claims. She's not shopping for any, any forum. And as far as the statute of limitations, um, fraud, racketeering, and unjust enrichment, this is a different unjust enrichment claim. If we read the facts of, she did pretty well for a, a pro se litigant. If we read the facts of the unjust enrichment, they relate to um, keeping that money for all of that time. It's a different claim than the, than the prior claim. And number two, fraud and racketeering. She discovered those, the facts that would give rise to both of those claims after. And we know that under the discovery rule, the, the statute of limitation does not run until the facts which uh, give rise to the cause of action are discovered. And so that's why those are there. Well, knew or should have known, Mr. Thompson. It's not just discovered, it's new or should have known. Understood. So when is your when is your argument that she knew or should have known of those claims? So your honor, after the um, first claim was dismissed, she was still, as, as I stated, still very much concerned that her individual rights were not heard, and that's why she filed the second one. So when the second one was dismissed, that's when she knew or should have known that her claims for fraud, racketeering, and these other claims that she's put in here for uh, cross claims, uh, th that's when those facts arose. Until that time, she was uncertain of her standing before the court especially as an individual, the sole beneficiary of this trust. A beneficiary is not the same as a trustee. And so her bringing those claims as an individual, as the sole beneficiary of the trust that would receive not only the excess proceeds, but would then have standing, which was denied her, have standing to argue and present evidence at the trial, she wasn't allowed that full and fair opportunity to litigate and again, that's why she brought the second one as an individual. We disagree with that, the court's ruling in that case. We believe that there's no, there's no theory where an individual who tries to participate in the trial should be um, barred by claim or issue preclusion from bringing those claims as an individual. So those, those are the theories, Your Honor. And I know you're well versed in this. We're just trying to make a record and, and Nona, uh, did hire me to make these arguments on her behalf. So thank you for allowing that. Not a problem. The, the question that I have though, and, and what's, here's what's troubling me, and Mr. Lachman, I'll allow you to make your record in a moment here, but here's what, what is troubling me, is to the extent that this is up in the Court of Appeals right now, if the court of appeal if if the court of appeals makes a decision that the lower court got it wrong then the the then you would essentially have dual track complaints on claims that arise out of the same issues being handled in two different courtrooms which i don't think works um, and to the extent that the second case was a quiet title, unjust enrichment and declaratory relief, I mean, I know that we've got this third case that have claims for fraud and racketeering. Um, 
whether or not those survive just based on the allegations, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to make that decision right now. I'm going to, I'm going to take a look at it again. But to the extent that the other claims are similar as to what's going on in the second case, my inclination on this is to wait and see what the what the Supreme Court does. So, Mr. Lockman, why don't you weigh in, and then I'm going to ask Mr. Scow, and if you can address that issue as you weigh in on the other issues, Mr. Lockman, I'd appreciate it, but then I'm going to have Mr. Scow weigh in and Mr. Thompson weigh in on what is concerning to the court right now, because I don't want to turn this into an even bigger rodeo than it already is. Yes, Your Honor, Scott Eppling uh, for Wells Fargo and Nation Star for the record. There are actually two appeals that this court uh, should be aware of. One is the appeal that uh, from the second case that uh, Mr. Scow raised. The second is a case involving interpleader funds. And it's a case called Thornburg, and it's um, case number 80111. And that's a case in $2 million in excess proceeds. And in that case, the issue is who is entitled to the funds, the borrower or the bank? And when, when should the statute be uh, read? Should it be read at the time of the foreclosure sale? Should it be read at the time of the sale um, and that appeal is fully briefed we're waiting for a decision um, like Mr. Scow said the second the the appeal from the um, second action is pending briefing um, the opening brief is due August 26 so briefing will likely be done close to the end of the year if not early in the year uh, we agree with Mr. Scow that to the extent Ms. Tobin alleges that the sale should be void, whether in the first action, second action, third action. She's not entitled to proceeds if she thinks the sale should be void. Right. And to the extent that this court does agree that she is entitled to proceeds if, if, the, if she believes that the sale is void, then perhaps the court stays um, or orders proceeds to Ms. Tobin, but stays stays um, distribution of those proceeds until there is an until the second case is over. Um, going to the merits of the motion to dismiss, we agree with Mr. Scow and uh, Red Rock that this case is claim precluded. It meets the three factors. There have been two final judgments. The subsequent action is based on the same claims or any part of them that were or could have been brought in the first action. That's that's the magic language. Could have been brought. Um, and then there's also privity between the parties. And it, to the extent there's not privity under the Waddell versus Stewart case, uh, Ms. Tobin has no good reason for failing to include in uh, those first or second actions. Um, what, what the bank's request is that this court dismiss the cross claims against the two banks Certify that judgment as final under 54B so that that can be appealed. Because that's, 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 the cross claims and counter claims against Red Rock are completely separate from interpleader. And then stay in their action pending the second case and perhaps the, uh, the Thornburg appeal. I mean, and if this court, and then the only other thing I'd like to address is that to the extent that the new fraud racketeering claims are are valid um maybe they're valid against red rock perhaps for things they did with the interpleader money keeping them in red rock safe for the past six years but those claims have nothing to do with uh nation star wells fargo we've had nothing to do with the interpleader funds over the past six seven years so uh, again this case is unmeritorious it should it should be barred by claim preclusion. It should be barred by um, statute of limitations on the merits. Uh, this is just a, a third attempt by Ms. Tobin to continue litigating against the banks. 
Mr. Scow, want to weigh in? Sure. And yeah, going going to your question about you know the impact of the second appeal. <clears throat> if if I understood you right, because you asked, you know, what should the court do given that second appeal? I mean, the way I I think about it is, you know, we've we've heard arguments from Nona's counsel, and and he's essentially re-arguing cases one and two. I mean, that that's just further proof that we should have claim preclusion here. But there, if if there was perhaps a reversal, and maybe that's what your honor is thinking about, what would happen if there's a reversal by the appellate court in case two? Well, then that means that the case is remanded and proceedings would continue and she would have her day in court as part of that action. What shouldn't happen is, well, you know what, that one's pending. We're not sure what's going to happen, so now we're going to file a third action. We're going to bring these same types of claims again. And that, that's just, that's not how it works. Your Honor mentioned form shopping. That, that's what it is. I mean, these were claims she could have brought before and, and didn't. And these are claims that aren't properly pled. They're barred by claim preclusion. They're barred by the statute of limitations. And, and Your Honor properly pointed out it's when you knew or should have known. And our Supreme Court, and as well as the federal courts, have pointed to the date of the sale as things. That, that's when it's going to give party notice, parties notice of what's going on. Because there's, there's been a sale. It would cause you to look at what's happening you know, with this property. And I, Mr. Thompson brought up the fact that, as he was re-arguing case one, that Ms. Tobin wasn't allowed to appear in her individual capacity. I, I was only bringing up the fact that she interpled in her capacity as trustee, but she was she was there in her capacity as trustee. It was still known to Tobin. So it's it's a it's a difficult position for for her because you're not allowed to keep litigating the same types of claims over and over. And um, you know that that's why our motion should be granted. But then I agree with with what Mr. Lachman said. We we can keep the interpleader aspect of it because that has to be decided by by this court. That's the purpose of the interpleader. Um, and and Ms. Tobin may be entitled to those funds. I I don't I don't know. I mean I I can't make that conclusion. No, okay. you know, any other questions for me? I, I hope I answered your question. You did. Um... I just, I guess I would like to know what your thought process is of me simply staying this whole thing until such time as the Court of Appeals comes back because arguably that would have been, if it gets remanded, so let's just play this out for a second here. If it gets remanded, then to the extent that the fraud and racketeering claims are even viable um, and based on the statute of limitations as well as how they've been pled, um, I don't know if there's enough to rise to the level of the 9B that you would be required under, under the fraud allegations. I don't know if there's enough there. Um, I want to take a second look at that. Um, but that being said, arguably those causes of action, this whole entire thing could be consolidated into the other case um, is probably how that would play out if I simply were to stay this and not dismiss it because arguably then if, if I do dismiss it and the other one were to get reversed, she could at that point um, potentially move to amend it in, in that case. Would you agree with me on that? Absolutely agree. Okay. Absolutely so, agree. So maybe what we do for purposes here is we simply stay this whole kit and caboodle until such time as the Court of Appeals decides what it's going to do on the second case other than the cross claims that have been um, done against Nation Star and Wells Fargo as Mr. Lockman indicated. Is that a 
resolution at this point or do we need do I need to take it a step further and and make a ruling on this case at this juncture and I guess your honor my comment would be on on her claims I think it is proper and actually appropriate to make a ruling on those claims because if the resulting case too is a reversal and remand then just like your honor said she can amend and, and make these other claims there okay. but it, it's it's procedurally awkward and inappropriate and improper <clears throat> that you would just file successive cases and let's wait and see what happens in a in another matter because a, an appeal of itself does not does not impact the doctrine of claim for collusion if there's still been a final judgment right so yes it's on appeal but if there's a reversal then what happens is that matter comes back to life and and the parties then have to litigate and so case two could be resurrected and case two would then proceed that's that's fine i acknowledge that could happen um, but but case three there's no reason to have the same claims here in, in this matter when they've already been dismissed a couple of times before and except your honor again i keep coming back to the interpleader issue that is the reason this case was was brought is so that that issue could be determined so that one that one has to remain and and that one could be stayed depending what happens in in case two and that makes sense to me your honor because uh, you know there's a chance that case two is resurrected and there's a reversal and and so then now we've got a question again was the sale valid that that could happen all right mr thompson yes i'll i'll just keep it to um the your honor's question about wait and see is that correct yes okay so i envision the situation if the whole thing is not stayed including the cross claims and the counter claims where another appeal could be filed and that would complicate things worse and cause more attorney's fees to be spent. If this entire action is stayed, um, you know, without prejudice to all the parties, I don't think there would be any harm to the parties as we wait to see what happens in this second appeal. Um, and so I would say if we're going to stay, let's either stay the whole thing or rule on the whole thing, but, but don't piecemeal it because what do we do with known as appealable rights um, if she lets them go and then they say we can simply amend the second action to include those claims, um, there could be some, some issues there with, um, you know, finality and not appealing those, those, those issues. Since we believe, um, even though there's been argument made that they're the same claims, we believe they are different claims and that they were discovered after the fact. Um, just another another point on that um, Red Rock um, who brought this interpleader was not a party in the first case so they've only been parties in the second and this one which is I think the reason why both Mr. Laughlin and, and Mr. Scow are saying at least correct me if I'm wrong gentlemen that why the interpleader stays because they weren't a party to the other lawsuit well, they were in the second one where we yeah, after that that case, second case was dismissed, and that's the one that's on appeal. Mr. Scow, Mr. Lockman, anything else? Uh, your, your Honor, this this is Scow Lockman again, um, and. It, Going back to non-mutual claim preclusion under um, the Waddell versus Stewart case, the third factor is whether there's privity and if a plaintiff can't provide a good reason for failing to include a new defendant in the previous action. She, she clearly could have included Red Rock in the first action. Um, um, claim preclusion applies. Again, I'm going to put that out there. Claim preclusion, claim preclusion, claim preclusion. Okay. The, the, the final issue that this court must decide is whether to, whether to stay. I believe staying the interpleader portion of this lawsuit is appropriate given the second appeal, but staying the cross the, the cross claims and the counterclaims against Red Rock and uh, the banks 
is inappropriate. Those, 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 those claims should be dismissed, and the uh, court should grant 54B relief. If, if Ms. Tobin believes those claims have any merit, go ahead and appeal them. Create a, create a third appeal on claim preclusion. I mean, and, and perhaps those, those cases would be consolidated at some point, but those cases they should not for another year, a year or two, given given the backlog at the Nevada Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. Well, I guess the only thing that I'm considering, Mr. Laughlin, um, in relation to that is what harm does it do at this juncture to stay everything? Because listen, if I don't stay it and I rule in your favor, arguably we're going to have another appeal that's instantly filed and then you're going to have two appeals going at the same time, attorneys spending fees unnecessarily, and um, potentially different decisions being made. So. I guess my thought process is, and trust me, I don't know whether or not this is the right way to go, but I'm just talking this out with you guys. I'm going to issue a written opinion on it, but um, what harm is there at this juncture to simply stay everything and not continue to run up fees and costs pending the outcome of that second appeal? Uh, Your Honor, this is Scott Lightman. Uh, the fee, Miss Tobin. I mean, I don't know Miss Tobin, but I, I I can assume from her prior litigious past that she intends to appeal this third case. Um, so we're going to have an appeal regardless. Um, leave, leaving the cross claims and the counter claims pending will will simply just delay delay the inevitable. Um, we're we're going to have an appeal. It's just going to keep these cases on our books for longer than they need to be. The longer these cases stay on the books, um, I, I don't know about this, Mr. Scott with Red Rock, but I can tell you with with my bank clients, I have to provide my clients updates every single month. So every month, I have to inform my client this case has stayed, this case has stayed, and those fees add up every single month. And Your Honor, if I may, that okay. that was the similar concern that I was going to bring up because we have that same issue, and. I also wanted to add, you know, this is the reason what Your Honor just talked about, the confusion in all of these matters and the appeals, that's that's why we have claim preclusion. Right. Is so that this doesn't happen. It, it, it's almost like my kids were showing me that show Loki. I don't know if you've seen it, but the time continuum. And so we've got the same claims that are tried, and then there's an appeal. You've got the same claims that are tried, and then there's appeal. It, it creates this kind of odd time warp. And, and it's odd. Each claim, each case should stand in and of itself. And so if we were going to wait on case three to see what happens in case two, I guess we're just putting a pause on what's going to happen. It's inevitable. There will be another appeal. That's how she has carried herself on before. And again, the outcome in case two really shouldn't impact this case at all. Because if case two is affirmed, okay. If case three is reversed, well, then she's free to bring those claims and, and pursue them as part of case two. And so it, it is it is possible that then you have multiple appeals happening at the same time, but there's going to be an appeal regardless. And so I, I hate to reference Loki, Your Honor, during my oral arguments, but that's, you know, that's what happens. We've got this time continuum issue when parties keep bringing the same claims. I guess the only thing that I was thinking about is, you know, to the extent that you would really have claim preclusion potentially if the court of, if the Supreme Court said, nope, we're affirming, um, then you really have claim preclusion. Um, it might make the, the decision here a, 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 even stronger, I guess, if that's the way that the court were to go and find that there was claim preclusion. So um, that's the Honor, only I, thing that I was thinking. That's the only thing I was thinking. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that thought. And there, I, I see the reasoning there. The Supreme Court actually commented on that. We cited it in our, our brief 
that the appeal of a judgment does not negate the judgment's finality for claim preclusion purposes. That was the Edwards, I'm going to mispronounce the last name, but Edwards v. Gondar case from 2007. Um, they just said it. So, I mean, but I, I see I see exactly what, what the court is, is saying on that, and it does strengthen things. But again, if, if there was a reversal, then we don't even have to worry about case three at all. It should still be dismissed because now the claim should still be heard as part of, part of part case of two. Case two. All right. Um, yeah. I'm going to issue a written opinion on this. Anything else from anybody at this juncture? Your Honor, this is Scott. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The only other thing that I'm, I'm thinking is we've heard here that Ms. Tobin has said that she hasn't had an opportunity to uh, – present her case that's that, that's what that's what they're saying is part of the first case but i believe miss tobin's on the line so that she has her full day in court if she has anything to add um with this court's indulgence i would i would submit that miss tobin should and again if, if her attorney agrees if she has anything to add put it on the record so that we don't have a fourth case or a fifth case I, the problem is mr lockman she's represented by counsel now so technically unless she's asking to testify as a witness technically she can't so, um, mr i'm Thomas? sorry my my internet was breaking up when he was talking and also your honor okay what i i i heard mr lockman say that maybe he'd like to hear from nona tobin and then i did not hear your, your honor's reply well what i said was is to the extent that she's represented by counsel um, I don't know if it would be appropriate for her to speak unless she was speaking for the purposes of creating an evidentiary record or was being called as a witness. But, Mr. Thompson, if you want to let your client speak, I will be willing to listen to what she has to say. So, Your Honor, I again, going back to our intermission before we started arguing, um, for purpose of the record, um, we were under the impression, based on the order and notice of entry of order and the record, that this would be an evidentiary hearing. Um, we prepared for an evidentiary hearing the best that we could via blue jeans. We understand there may have been an issue with master calendar. Um, however, unless we're going to put on our full testimony, as she wanted to do in the first case, but was denied that opportunity, I don't think it's appropriate to, to piecemeal. Um, Mr. Lockman can certainly depose her if, if he'd like, or we can, we can discuss that if he wants to get uh, on the record all of her arguments, but she's never had that opportunity. Um, I just want to also say that, you know, here we've said that that the likely outcome, if the second appeal is remanded, is that um, that these two actions would be consolidated. I agree with that. And in response to Your Honor's question about what harm would come from staying the entire matter, the only response that we have is that you keep it on the books. Well, I, <laughs> this is my 31st year in practice. I have clients where I have to status the file and and report to them. And when I say it's been stayed until this other matter, then then my secretary clicks a button and says stayed, 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 stayed. It's continued to be stayed. There's no attorney time. It's very negligible. So um, I like the solution. Um, I um, I think a lot of what Nona has done with the second, and also her counterclaims and cross claims in this action, are because she doesn't want to lose out on her rights, and she feels like. They've, they've never been adjudicated, that she's not had her day in court. And so, um, you know, if, if that gets affirmed, then that sends a strong message. The second appeal gets affirmed. If it, if it gets remanded, then we get to litigate, hopefully, finally, all of um, her individual claims as, as we set forth. And, and I wasn't aware of the Thornburg case, Your Honor. And so, I, so um, that also, if it's, if it's on the issues, and I have no reason to believe that Mr. Lockman is misrepresenting the issues that are there, I mean, um, then, then that might also shed some, some light, not only on, on these counterclaims and cross-claims and, and the second appeal case, if it's remanded, but would also shed light on, on the uh, issues before the court relating to interpleader. 
right. Anything else from anybody? Your Honor, thank you so much for your time today. We know it's been a long, a long morning, so thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to go ahead and issue. Clearly, um, I'll just say this, Mr. Thompson, um, just on the basis of the record in and of itself, um, you know, your motion was a motion for summary judgment. The court doesn't even need to, I think, even weigh in on the fact that there would be genuine issues of material fact here that would preclude summary judgment. And Your Honor, I I agree that it was likely brought prematurely and and, and by uh, known and not understanding the procedural rules. Okay, so um, to the extent that the motions to dismiss are still live, the court for today, what the court's going to do, Mr. Thompson, is the motion for summary judgment is going to be denied. Um, the court finds it just on the record in and of itself that there's genuine issues of fact here. But the court is going to issue a written opinion on the motion to dismiss. Um, and um, I think the parties both agree that even if I were to dis grant the motion to dismiss, that the interpleader stays. So that's so what's left for me to issue my written opinion on is going to be the motion to dismiss and I will issue a written opinion on that. Would everybody agree that that's accurate at this juncture? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. All right. All right, then um, matters taken under advisement and I will issue a written opinion. Um, I will let you all know that I might be, go this one's a little bit meaty, so it's going to take me some time to do. So don't expect it within the next, you know, week or so. It's going to take me a little bit of time to get to it. Okay? No problem. Thank you so much, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Have a good day, gentlemen. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor.